timely. This week, I'm going to talk about something you're going to, oh, he's going to talk about money. Um, tithe. The blessing of first. The blessing of the first. Everyone, as soon as you hear tithe, you think, oh, some of y'all already have shut me out right now. You're like, okay, I'm going to get my phone. I'm going to do whatever. He's going to talk about. I want you to know first thing, tithing really hadn't, doesn't have anything to do with money. It has everything to do with your heart. That's what tithing is. Tithing has everything to do with your heart. So we want to talk about that today. Um, I'm going to share that with you. Uh, some of you received um, last week, I guess last week it was, some of you received your, uh, we, we give out a six-month giving record for you, um, for you to be able to have and compare to your records and, and all that and have it if you need it for IRS, if that's what you do. But we sent that out also listed, or with that was a letter from me thanking you, and, and then there was also a, um, uh, a financial report of the church just showing, um, praise God, growth. <laughs> we always love to see growth. And, and, and praise God for that. And some of y'all are probably thinking right now, why is he going to talk to us about tithing? Because you are one of the highest percentage churches that tithe. The average church in America, 20% of the church tithes. That's a sin right there. This church, real life church, and my bookkeeper's right here, and tell them, correct me if I'm wrong, but around 80 to 85% of this church tithes regularly. Am I on right there on that bookkeeper? All right. The professional bookkeeper that we have. <laughs> the real bookkeeper. That's an inside joke. I shouldn't. But anyway, um, so that's the case. And, and then here's the thing. Um, you, you all do that. But how many of you know we need to be reminded sometimes? We need reminders. It's just like I said a couple weeks ago when I talked about the Sabbath. I said, I know you all heard this. Some of you all heard this. Some of you have never heard it before. But we have to talk about it. It's like, well, you've said that before. Why talk about it again? Well, I've also talked about Jesus dying on the cross. I should never talk about it again. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? There are things in his book that he gives us in the word of God that tells us, and we need to be reminded of those things. They tell us how to live. So let's talk about this just for a moment here. Um, go to my first scripture. And our first point, the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Exodus 13, 1 and 2 says, consecrate to me. Who's me? Capital M, me, God, right? So, consecrate to me all the firstborn. You see what I have highlighted there, because that's the key word there. First. Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. Who is it? Who's it belong to again? Who is that mine? God. Capital M. That little phrase right there, it is mine, reminds me of those seagulls in um, Finding Nemo. Mine, 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 mine. That's, you know, God say it. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. I give you all of this. The first is mine. The first is mine. Next scripture, Exodus 13, verses 12 through 13 says, You must present all firstborn sons and firstborn male animals to the Lord, for they belong to him. A firstborn donkey may be brought bought back from the Lord by presenting a lamb or a young goat in its place, but if you do not buy it back, you must break its neck. However, you must buy back every firstborn son. Now, let me just kind of break down that scripture for you a little bit. That scripture is talking about a donkey and a lamb. Donkey represents unclean. The lamb represents clean. And you have a donkey. So what does he say? He says you need to redeem it with the lamb. If you don't and you go on and don't do anything, he says you're going to lose it anyway. Just break its neck because I'm not going to honor it. I'm not going to bless it. Let me just real quick. If we look at tithing, if you're not giving the first 10%, he says it's like break, just break its neck because I'm not going to redeem the rest. 
There's a difference there. See, for years, Christy and I, we gave 10%. I gave 10% like this. All right, let's get the bills done. Let's go get the mortgage done. Let's get this done. Let's get this done. And then I had this much left over, but I, 10% was this much. Like, oh, man, now i got to give 10% to the church. Anybody ever been like that? Don't raise your hand. You'll, I'm not asking you. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Um, don't do that, all right? But I would, we would, it was a bill. And it was back here. God says, you give me first, before you the mortgage, before whatever credit card payment, before the groceries, before the car payment. You give me 10% first. That's the key. First. Give that to me first, and I redeem the, the rest. Okay. In this room, I, I, I know, I'm talking to a group of people that know what it is to tithe. How many of you would say, since you've been tithing, God has blessed the less amount that you had before in your mind and on paper but he has blessed and redeemed that 90%. And you have seen it firsthand. And you're better off today because you're tithing financially. Raise your hand. See, I'm speaking to the... Y'all all get it. You get it. So that's what this is saying. And here, here's an amazing thing about this. Because it has to be redeemed. It has to be redeemed. And this is something that... That, that stood out to me. I actually, I, I, there's, a, there's an incredible book. Um, it's called, uh, Robert Morris, it's uh, The Blessed Life. If you've never read that book, it's one of the best books you'll ever read. It's li it was life-changing for Christy and I. Life-changing. And, and it talked about this, the first, and, and, and how our, it's, it's all about your relationship in your heart, your relationship with God. And, and so, he said this in it, and he said this, and I had to stop and think for a second. But he said, Jesus is God's tithe. See, there was an unclean, talked about the donkey, and there's a clean. And the unclean had to be redeemed. They had to break the donkey's neck if he was redeemed. So you had to redeem him by a lamb. It says it right there. You had to redeem him. Who in this room, were you, were you born clean or were you born unclean? You were born unclean, right? For we were all born into sin. Was Jesus born clean or unclean? He's the only one that was ever born clean. And Jesus died on the cross to redeem you. So when you tithe, it's not a bill. It is showing the redemption power of Jesus on the cross and what Jesus has done for you. Do you get that? It's not about giving money. It's about the redemption process and what he'll do for you. We talked about Sabbath just a couple days ago and, or a couple weeks ago, and, and, and I explained to you it was like tithing. We give 10% first. We also... We have seven days a week. God says, I rested on the seventh day. How many of y'all think God needed to rest? This is God. But he give you an example. And so we're supposed to have a Sabbath. Go throughout. Go, just go back and watch that message. But the Sabbath, you will do more with your six days if you'll Sabbath on the seventh. If you'll take rest. More will get accomplished. More things will be done. Because you are in order with what he's asked you to do. So, the first one, firstborn, must be sacrificed or redeemed. The first one must be sacrificed or redeemed. Um, number two, let's go to my next one. The, um, the first fruits must be offered. The first fruits must be offered. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10 says, Honor the Lord with your possessions, and with the first fruits, all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. So how, 
How is it that your barns are going to be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow? Because you honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits. Exodus 23, 19. The first of the first fruits. That's kind of like going, you know, look, if you guys don't get it, let me just say this to you this way. The first of the first fruits. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. I've got the word bring there because let me explain something to you. You don't give tithes. They don't belong to you. He's, who, what did God say they are? God said they're mine, 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 right? They don't belong to you. So you don't give them. And every time in the Bible when it talks about tithes and talks about first fruit, it says you bring because they belong to him. What do you, if, you bring it, if you bring something to me, why? Because it belongs to me. Bring. So you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. Number uh, or Malachi 3.10, that's the one always, everybody knows that scripture about tithing. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse. Um, the tithe belongs to the Lord. The tithe isn't missions. The tithe isn't the televangelists that you might want to support. Those are offerings. And the Bible talks about tithe and offerings. So those are offerings. Those you give. You see that? Those you give. You pray about it and you ask God, what do you want me to do? And you give. I give to missions. I increase my missions by a little bit every year. Because as we go through the year, God just blesses us through the year. We get to the end of the year and go, wow, we were able to do that every single month and it wasn't a problem. Let's go a little bit more. And God just blesses more. I love the fact that when we look at our missions and things that come in, when it's missions, that extra giving, the bulk of it is from leadership in this church, which tells me that's the right thing. The leadership of this church, the staff and the board members, all of them are always first ones. The track leaders of our church are so faithful. That means they're an example, an example. So as we look at this with tithes, um, the tithe belongs to the house of the Lord. You do not designate your tithe. I remember having a story about a lady. She, um, she had sold some property, so, so there was a tithe. She made a profit. Okay, some people always ask me, if I sell my house, should I, should I pay tithe on the whole amount? Should I? Well, number one, you don't talk to me, open your Bible and pray and read. And if you want my suggestion, you, pray, you, pay, you give tithe on the profit. If you paid $200,000 for your home and you sold your home for $300,000, what's the profit? $100,000. That's the part you pay on because you're already paid that already. It just makes sense, doesn't it? It's really not hard. I had a lady, she, um, <laughs> she, had, she had sold a house, had a good chunk of money, and so she gave her tithe to the church and said, I only want this used to go out and buy a grand pipe organ. It's a church about this size. So it would have been pipes all the way across the back wall um, to be able to do this. Your tithe is not something you have that, that's not yours to designate and say, do this, do this. If you want to get a pipe organ, that's an offering. Am I making sense? Okay. So, um, you don't designate, you bring. God never uses the word give, you bring. Um, the Bible gives you two choices when it comes um, to the tithe. You can bring it to the house, or you can steal it from God. Those are the two choices. That's the only two choices he gives you. Um, look at Malachi 3.8. Malachi 3.8 says this, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. 
Now that's funny because it says tithes and offerings this time. How many of you have ever been somewhere and God speaks to you and says, you know what, that you need to help feed people in Nepal and reach them. And you're going, I just I can't, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to the bathroom right now. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get out of this service because I am feeling like I, I'm just getting out of here. You know, it, y'all know what I mean by that, don't you? And God's speaking to you. And sometimes when God speaks to you, it's like, man, God, I can't do that. How many of you know when God tells you to do something, he didn't tell you, he didn't ask you, can you do it? He just says, I'm going to do this through you. So, tithes and offerings. Joshua 7.11 tells us this. It says, Israel has sinned and broken my covenant. They have stolen some of the things that I commanded must be set apart for me. And they have not only stolen them, but have lied about it and have hidden the things among their own belongings. This is the story of uh, when Joshua leads the Israelites into Jericho the first time. They are going to start conquering cities. The very first city they conquer is Jericho. They conquer ten cities. How many of y'all know that? Ten cities, and God says, that one... You don't take anything. You don't take any of the riches. Everything goes to the temple. Everything goes. It was just a tent at the time, but everything goes to the temple. It goes to my house, and then you know what? You can have everything else. They conquer nine more cities that had more money and more riches and more stuff than Jericho had. But God says you can have everything else, but the first is mine. Do you see that? See, tithing is not just in the book of Malachi, it's all throughout the Bible. And and so when that happens, there was a man named Achan, and and it was sent out, nobody take anything. Well, Achan saw, he saw him a nice robe that he thought he looked sharp in. And so he took it, he stole it, because how you know when God says it's mine, and you take it, you know, come on, he's got so much already. He does have a lot. He has, what is it, all the cattle on all the hills? The earth is his? But when he says it's mine. So Achan hides that. Achan also, he steals, and and that number comes up over again, but 30 pieces of silver. He takes money, he takes clothing, and he hides it, buries it under his tent, and the next time the Israelites go out, they don't do so well. And Joshua's going, God, what happened? What's going on? What did I do wrong? And he says, you have sin in your camp. And they start to, they they were separated into groups. And they start going from group to group to group until they come down to Achan. And Achan is stolen. What happened to Achan? He said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just, you know, it looked really good. I thought it looked good here. I'm sorry. God said, they need to die. Burn his tent. Burn him and his family with him. What that sends to me, now you take it the way you want to, that sends to me when I rob from God and I steal from God and I'm not obedient to God, I affect my bloodline and my family. So so we see that and we see obedience here and how important it is. Another example Another example um, was the story of Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Um, do I have another? I have another scripture, don't I? Go to the next one. Maybe. Cain and Abel. Um, Cain and Abel. It says this: When it was time for the first for the harvest, Cain presented. Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. He looked dejected. Y'all know the story of Cain and Abel. You know what Cain does. When God said, I want you to bring a sacrifice to me. 
Can we go? Can we go one more slide forward, please? It should be there, unless I just really messed up. Because I want to point to it. There it is. All right. When it's time for the harvest came presented, look at the word. Some of his crops. See, that story, when I was a kid in Sunday school, I had this sweet, sweet sister butler taught our Sunday school class when I was in elementary. Who remembers Sunday school? And Sister Butler taught that class, and God bless her, but Sister Butler, we asked, you know, well, she told us the reason, because God doesn't like vegetables. (laughs) I thought, man, this is awesome. Mom, God don't like vegetables, and neither do I, you know? God bless that sweet woman. You're asked to do a Sunday school class. It doesn't mean you have to have a master's, okay? (laughs) But what does the scripture say? It says that Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift. What does it say about Abel? Abel brought the best of the firstborn. There's a difference there. I worked when I, when I was in high school. I worked for a grocery store and I worked in the produce department. And we had a pig farmer that would come um, because at night... We would go through, you know, go through the tomatoes, and, and if something felt like it, that's going to be bad tomorrow, put it in the thing, and you took it back, and you took everything that was bad. That's why today, if we go to the grocery store, we're getting produce, Christy always says, you go pick the produce, because I just did this for years, um, picking what was bad, what was going to go bad, pulling it out, and then we would take it, and we had these 50-gallon drums, and we would dump all that stuff in there, and this pig farmer came once a week, and he took the 50-gallon drums, and he fed his pigs. When I read that, he gave some of his crops to the Lord. See, when we, what we give to the Lord is what's left over. Hey, you know what? Man, that is a prize winning pumpkin, right? I mean, those giant pumpkins, you know, that's prize winning. I ain't giving that to God. I'm putting that over here. Let me give that one. That one's getting pretty soft on the bottom. It's getting kind of nat- starting to smell. Let's take that one. I mean, we're going to burn it anyway. Let's take that and put it on the altar to sacrifice. See, when you bring your offering, your tithe, it's a sacrifice. So when he brought that in, it says he just brought some. See the difference in the language? He brought some, but he brought the best of the firstborn. The best. What are you giving to God? Are you giving him first? First. Tithing tells a lot about people. Because it's about obedience and it's about your heart. Um, I've said this before. One day, I'm going to have to love a young man like a son because he's going to marry my daughter's. One's going to, each one. I'm sorry, two men are going to be in my life one day. I'm going to have to love them. (laughs) But I promise you this. I will look at their tithing record. Because you ain't dating my daughter if you don't tithe. Because if you're willing to rob from God... I'm not putting her anywhere near you. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's my daughter. That's my prized possession. I'm not going to put her in the hands of a thief. Because that's what the Bible says. And the Bible says when you're a thief, you're cursed. I am not putting my daughter into that. So I'm going to go. They're dating. I'm going to go to Miss Vicky and say, Miss Vicky, look up Wilbur's. <laughs> I'll say that because they ain't married no Wilbur either. Um, I don't know. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. But I'll say, Miss Vicky, I want to see. Let me know. Do they tithe? Are they given to missions? Are they obedient? Because I want to know. How many of y'all does that make sense to you? How many every dad in this room would say, I agree with that 100%. All right, I just say, if you say I agree with that, I want you to look at your own checking account too. 
You see what I'm saying? Tithing is about obedience. It's about obedience. Third one, third point. The tithe must be first. The tithe must be first. Leviticus, Leviticus 27, 30 says, One-tenth of the produce of the land, whether from the, gain from, or the grain from the fields or the fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord, must be set apart to him as holy. Do you get it again? The first, tenth. Then we have, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. That there may be food in my house and try me now in this. That, that line, try me, is the only time that God ever says, try me. He doesn't say, go out and get sick and try and see if I heal you. He doesn't do that. It's the only time in the Bible he ever says this. He says, try me. Try me. Whenever I come to this point, my board gets real nervous. Because I've said this before. If you've never tithed, then I challenge you. Because this is the God challenges you. So I'm only just stepping out what he's doing. If you've never tithed, or maybe you've only been tithing 2%, and you know when you look at it, it's like, oh, I should do more. But I just can't. I'm telling you there is blessing for obedience and for your heart. I know that personally. And there are people in this room that will raise their hand and say, I know that personally. So, here it is. Try me now on this. If you're in this church and, and you really don't tithe, then I challenge you for the next three months to begin to tithe. Begin to tithe. At the end of those three months, 90 days from now, you come to me and say, you know what? I've been tithing and everything is falling apart. I can't pay bills. I'm losing my everything. We will give you, we will write a check and give you all your tithes back. I'll get back to you. Because I trust his word and what his word says. And his word says that he'll bless you. Now, if you come back to us in three months and go, oh, I didn't. I didn't, everything's going bad. And we look at it and your tithe is, you know, $5 a month. Um, you were tipping God. You weren't tithing God. Because if you're living on $50 a month, we have to pray for you for a whole other thing. All right? <laughs> we need to pray for provision. We need to pray for God to step in. Do you all know, know what I'm saying? It's common sense. So it says, try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. And look what he says. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will be or not be room enough to receive it. Let me just stop right there because we are not financially. It's like, oh, well, God opens up the windows of heaven and money just falls on you and you won the lotto and all. That's not it. But God blesses you in ways. And you'll look back at your life and go, how did I do that? How was I able to do that? How did that happen? And, 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 and you'll look back and go, it was just the hand of God. How he has blessed us. And that is not monetary. That is peace and joy. It's the right relationships. It's, it's, it's your children. It's, you just see it. And you look back and go, the favor that God gave me. Anybody with me? Yes. All right. So y'all think this is all about money? It doesn't, is it? It's about the heart. It's about obedience. Here's the amazing thing. I, I love this. And I didn't see this till just a couple years ago. But because we always stop right there. Woohoo, the windows are open. Let's go. You know, we just stop right there. <laughs> but look at the next scripture. He says this, and I will rebuke. The devourer for your sakes. What is that? Because you bring your tithe into the storehouse. Because you're obedient and your heart puts me first. I'm going to open the windows of heaven upon you. And I'm going to rebuke the devourer who is trying to steal from you. Rob you. Kill you. Destroy you. 
I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. People, don't take that just literal. Think about that. What's the fruit in your life? What's the fruit in your life? That he will not be able to devour. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Says the Lord of hosts. When it comes to tithing, you don't have to be legalistic about it first, right? I mean, I always, when, when, when we get paid, we get paid every other week. So when we get paid, um, you know, deposit money. Um, I, I, I do mine where I take a picture of it and deposit it in the bank, and sometimes it takes a couple days for it to clear. Um, sometimes if I write my tithe check before I let it clear, that's not going to be a good thing. All right? Y'all know what I mean. Some of y'all like that. It's not, don't be legalistic. If we get our tithe and I haven't had a chance to write our check yet and Christy goes grocery shopping and she comes home and says, hey, I went to Walmart, went to Publix, I got all our groceries. I'm like, oh, we're cursed this week, honey. I didn't get a chance to tithe yet. <laughs> Do you understand? You don't have to be legalistic about it. It's the heart. It's the heart. As soon as that comes, I'm going to take care of that. That's the heart. As I said before, Christy and I, we, we've tithed. Actually, we paid our tithe bill for years. Even in our first years of ministry, we paid our tithe bill. But about 10, 12 years ago, we saw this and saw the obedience and that what it is to put God first. And it completely changed everything in our lives. I'll say this. When we switch that, we stopped living paycheck to paycheck. And it wasn't because we got more money. It's just because God began to bless our obedience. He made us wiser with how we did things. Better stewards. Because... We put him first. I don't share this message with you once or sometimes twice a year. I don't share this message with you so that you'll give more money to the church. I share this so that you will receive that blessing and know what it is to walk without a curse. And to walk with the windows of heaven opened above you. Blessing your steps forward, blessing everywhere you go. That's why I share this message. It's important to me. Now, as I look at, as I look at this, there's just something I've been praying about. Actually, I was driving home. You got to be careful when I have a long drive, guys, because God, that's when God talks to me. Christy's over there reading. The girls are in the back seat. Got the dog. They're falling asleep. The dog's snoring and tooting. And... Um, it's not good in a car. But that's when God begins just to speak to me while I'm driving. You're just looking at the road, you're driving. And I started thinking about some things that I saw. See, we're in Assemblies of God Church, right? You guys, I told you, 80, over 80% of this church ties on a regular basis. That is so much far ahead of what other churches are. I thank you for that. I thank you for your obedience. But then... I was looking at these reports they gave us while we were at council and, and, and see when you look at these lines, y'all see the yellow and then the blue and then the green. The Assemblies of God, if you look at their finances for the Assemblies of God overall, the yellow is just general fund, that's operating cost. The blue, it makes up world missions. The green makes up U.S. missions. So the blue and the green, all of that, 85% that goes through the assemblies of God has everything to do with missions and reaching souls. 
We are an Assemblies of God church. Our, our number one thing is not to build more buildings. It's not to get more property. I mean, I want God, as we do what God tells us, I promise you there's going to be a gym here in a couple of years. But that can't be our focus. His kingdom has to be our focus. And so when I look at this, I love being an Assemblies of God pastor. I love being an Assemblies of God pastor. Because when I see that, that means something to me. Now, I, I brought some things with me. This last year, um, these things are for you, you guys. You all received, you received this trophy. This trophy is for being the, um, the number two church um, in the state of South Carolina for per capita giving in missions. Okay? Amen. You're number two. One church gets number one every year. They have about 20 people in the church. And um, they have one person that really gives to missions, a very wealthy person. So when you take what that person gives to missions and they're 20 people, they're always the number one per capita giving church. But you guys were number two. All right. Then we got some other stuff uh, for the church overall. This came to us. This was last year. You were sixth place in the state of um, South Carolina for missions giving. And um, so you were sixth place. Uh, what we gave in the Assemblies of God for missions was over seven, well, almost $73,000 to missions. And then, <laughs> amen. Then there was, uh, there was more that you gave because we have, um, we have things that we give to that not Assemblies of God. All right. Um, and so we ended up giving $97,000 to missions last year. Uh, when you gave to, to Alan Griffin for Accelerate, he is not an Assemblies of God program. He's an Assemblies of God pastor, but it's not an Assemblies of God program. So you gave to that. We give um, to uh, Gina Helms, missionary to Tanzania. And uh, we have someone that gives to her every month, but we also, she's not an Assemblies of God missionary, but we love her. And she makes a difference. So we support her. There's a couple things that, that we do that aren't. This was um, a speed. I don't have this year's speed the light. This is the speed light from the year before. It was three thousand, but actually, y'all gave this year. Our youth gave five thousand dollars, and we're in the top five churches of missions giving for youth. <laughs> this is last year. Um, your for BGMC the children. They gave ten thousand six hundred and seventy dollars to mission, and they were number they were ninth. You were third in the state, but you were ninth in the nation for churches our size. So, all of those things sound really really cool, but here's the thing that was just hitting me. Praise God. 80-something percent of our church tithes. It's closer to 50% give to missions. And we did that. Can you imagine if 100% of our church was behind missions? If 100%. It doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be a lot, just that it's the heart and the obedience. See, here's what I have found for you. I've been doing this for a little while. I know I look young. Somebody stopped me while I was at council. <laughs> while I was at council, some guy going through the vendors and all this stuff, he stopped me and said, hey, you're a youth pastor, right? I went, no, but thank you. Um, Christy was at a table, and it was a, a table with a bunch of ladies, and they said, let's have the youngest lady share something at your table of what God has done. And they all looked at her and said, we want you to share and so she started sharing, and we've been in ministry for 28 years. They're all like, how old are you? You know, we thought you were 30. Um, so I love general counsel this week. Um, I colored my goatee at the right time, so it just helped. I don't even know where I was going. Um, 
but we can do even more. It's not about the amount. Like I said, I've been, in this, I've been doing this. This is 28 years this year that we've been in full-time ministry. And here's the thing. When a church has a heart for missions, okay? Just catch this for me for a second. You say, well, I can't give much. I can, I can give $5. $5 can change the world because of your heart. And when God says, you know what? That church is being obedient. That little, real life church, you know what? I got this guy over here. I got this family over here that love to give to missions. I need to get them to a missions giving church. And you won't believe what God does when you're just being obedient and how he adds to you. I want new souls. I want souls saved. But I also want people who are looking for a home church. This is what I get from people. This is what I get. I came here because I was looking for a spirit-filled, not afraid of the Holy Spirit, and a missions-minded church. If I can have those two things, I'm going to be happy. You wouldn't believe the people that have walked into this church, and that's what they've said to me. Praise God. I want people like that. I want people like that. So these things, they're nice, but they don't mean a whole lot to me. I mean, they're in my office because if my superintendent comes by, I'm going to look bad if I throw them all away. But I just don't really, that stuff just doesn't mean a lot. What means a lot is that the church, the church, that's real life church, that's you as a whole have a heartbeat for putting God first. For putting God first.